Okay, we now welcome on a very, very, very special guest. It is uh, actor and now author Matthew McConaughey. He's got a his memoir is out October twentieth. Uh, it's called Green Lights. It is, I'll say it right now, the coolest memoir of all time because yeah. it is uh, his life experience teaching you about uh, how to live life, how to be cool. But more than anything, you wrote it. You had a journal for 35 years, and then I read that you wrote it uh, by going to the desert for 52 days without electricity. Is that true? The first 12 days were without electricity, so I had a generator on me. Um, and I, I pack up these 36 years worth of diaries. I put them in the navigator. I buy um, 21 and 5 8 inch ribeyes. <laughs> I, I ziplock them. I get my uh, my long branch. Uh, I get three five gallon jugs of water and a generator and my laptop and a printer. And I headed out to this cabin in the desert. So for the first 12 days, were that was me. And then the other the other places I went after that were in the desert, but I did leave the generator and, and, and got some AC power hookup. So I had a little electricity. What, what was that like going back over the course of your life, which you had, I mean, most people don't keep a, a diary since the day that they're 15 years old or however young you were. Like going back and reading that stuff, was that the first time that you'd sat down and, and read your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I write this in the book. I always write things down not to remember. I write things down so I can forget them. You know, so I can go, oh, jotted that down. Cool. Now I can forget it. And that's what I've been doing since I was 14. Um, but I mind you, you know, the early stuff at 14, I'm, I'm a 14 year old kid writing, going to my, you know, for this reason that most people go to their diary to write about the shitty stuff, to write about, oh, you know, Gretchen broke up with me or, you know, Kathy Cook won't go out with me or this worked out or I got to second base last night or some kind of thing like that. And then in my early 20s, I had a time where I was kind of rolling, uh, catching a lot of green lights. I was in college. My relationships were good, man. I would think I, I was making a little money, had a little money in my pocket. Uh, and uh, I said, you know what, McConaughey, go write in your diary now while you're rolling. Go dissect this success you're having right now because you may get in a rut again, which I did, which we all do. And you can go back and look at what was I doing when I was rolling? Who was I hanging out with? Where was I going? What was I eating? What was I drinking? How was I seeing the world? And so um, that was something that I was happy I, I've done through my life is try to write things down when things are going well, because another rut's always coming. And when you if you if you keep track and make a little bit of it, there's a science to some satisfaction. There's some habits that I've found that I've had that have helped me be more satisfied and they help me get out of some of those ruts. What so I, I'm je I'm very jealous that you've kept a diary for that long and you could go back and kind of read your own thoughts from each phase of your life. What phase of your life or what age did you look back on? You're like, ooh, kind of a loser, or I'm embarrassed by that because I always think like, yeah, of myself as 23, I'm like, you did not know anything and you thought you knew everything. Yeah, well, there was that was part of the to answer your question a second ago. That was part of the the fear of going back and looking at these diaries. I was like, man, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be ashamed of this. I'm going to be see where I was an arrogant prick and thought I was a know it all, but actually, you know, was silly as could be, or was, was a foolish, was foolish about it. And look, what happened in sitting down with the diaries and writing the book, a lot of the, sh the shit that I thought I was going to be embarrassed about, I actually just laughed at myself. A lot of the stuff I thought I was going to be ashamed about, I actually, forgave myself or found that, oh, I had already made amends for that. And a lot of the stuff that I thought I, I was arrogant about, I, I, I was. And I was like, well, good for you at that age of thinking you were a know-it-all. Um, and you ended up stepping in shit because you thought you were a know-it-all. But look, you know what? You stepped in shit again and that was okay. So I'm glad you had the courage to think you were a know-it-all at that time because look at you, you ate shit <laughs> yeah. because you thought you knew it all. And that was good, you know? Yeah. Was, was there a specific thing that looking back over your diaries, you were like, man, I was, I was really wrong about that. And it actually ended up working out, but not for the reasons that I thought it would. Um, let me think, man. I mean, do you guys read that Scorpion Spring story <laughs> where, where, where I go, I get this, I get offered this, uh, uh, I was, I was in Hollywood. I'd, I'd already done days confused and I was about a year where I wasn't getting work. I was getting the first call back, second call back, third call back, but I wasn't getting the, wasn't getting the job. And 
it's because I was tight. I was a little, I was a little, I wouldn't take enough chances. Well, I get this blind offer to do this role. It's a one day role. It's, it's of this guy who's a, um, a, a drug runner down on the south border and the coyotes are going to bring over his drugs and instead of pay for him he's going to steal the drugs kill him on move on well i get this bright idea in my head at the time that i'm not going to read the script i'm not even going to read the scene uh i'm going to go back to how i first learned acting dazed confused man there were only three lines they were just throwing me in the middle of scenes and i improvised and worked for three weeks that's back when i was a natural you know and at this time in my life when this happened i was like trying to really study acting. I was like, forget this study and I'm going back. I'm not even reading the script, I'm not even reading the scene. So I show up on the set, having not read the scene. And I said, I'm just gonna be my man. I'm gonna do what my man would do, all right? And right before we were about to say action, uh, this uh, PA comes by and goes, hey, you wanna see the sides, Mr. McConaughey, and the sides of the, of the scene that day. And I decide I wanna see him. Looking back, probably because I was getting a little insecure about this grand plan I had, right? Well, I open up the sides, and I look at them. There's one page, two page, three page, four pages of a monologue in Spanish. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, man. And I felt this <laughs> bead of sweat come up on the back of my neck. And I'm like, can I get 12 minutes? And I don't know why I said 12 minutes. I remember in my mind at the time, I thought 12 minutes would be like not enough time to inconvenience the crew, but en enough time for me to go learn four pages of a monologue in Spanish because, hey, I took Spanish one semester in the 11th grade. Yeah, yeah. great. Well, guess what? Neither that, I did not, It was not enough time to learn it in Spanish. I've never seen that movie. I went back and did the take and was fucking embarrassed about that man it was uncomfortable i was stressed i felt horrible about it and that actually that moment is when i said okay bullshit from now on, i'm gonna over prepare i'm gonna out prepare people i'm gonna come in so prepared for scenes that you can call, call an audible put a blindfold on me wherever you want to drop me off in the world press record i'll be my man and that 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 embarrassing moment uh is what made me really understand that hey you got to prepare to be free you gotta do the early work so you can do the early work so you can play on the day right. yeah it's interesting you you put that That's in your same book way in sports. Yeah, yeah you said yeah. you said be conservative early so that you can be liberal later which i took to mean yeah. like put yourself in a situation where you have structure you have boundaries as you're preparing to do something and then when you're in the moment you've got all the background already prepared for you've got the the guide rails that allow you to really, That's it. you know, if you want to take the guide rails off later, you can, but it's better to have those right. in place than to just freewheel everything. Figure out the general set of rules up front. You know what I mean? If you want to, if you, if you want to do backflips in your sandbox, we'll go rake it and check for glass and stuff first and then blow in the wind. You know, you want to, um, we look at it in sports, man. I mean, you know, you get a new defensive coordinator coming to a situation and he's got, he's got all these complicated schemes. He's got great athletes, but if he's only there in year one, you see those players hesitating on the field because they're thinking. You don't want to be thinking when it's game time. Now, so have the time to handle, to take the time to really understand the rules and sort of what the general boundaries are. You spend enough time doing that, then you're then you're free to play. Yeah. Then you can do your backflips, buck naked in your sandbox. Then you can call an audible. Then you can have your instincts. You don't want to be thinking when you're when you're in the game whatever that game is it, it's absolutely true do you see it all the time in sports where the best players they're not thinking they're just reacting and they're just doing it second nature um how many times i didn't see this in the memoir how many times uh you you somehow omitted this but how many times during your diary going back were you like i think this is the year texas is back like i'm really feeling it this year <laughs> <laughs> you left that out. I didn't see that nice, part. Nice, <laughs> nice, lead, nice lead into these current times too. Uh, ah, yes. Um, well, they were back uh, uh, mm -hmm. quite a few times. They yep. were there. They were present along, along my writing. I was. I've always been a Longhorn fan, even since I was fourteen. I started writing, um, and uh, you know, I was keeping diaries when we won national championship. Uh, I was keeping diaries all the way through when we got to the national championship against uh, against Bama as well, and I still keep them. So uh, um, we got work to do as a team yeah. uh, to, to get back where we need to be. Yeah. Do you ever, um, 
when you give a pump up speech, when they ask you to give a pump up speech, you know, the, the, the let, let it fucking rip man, which was maybe the coolest speech mm-hmm. ever. And you guys beat Notre Dame. Do you feel extra pressure? Because if you give a great speech and you give like the Matthew McConaughey, let it fucking rip man. And then they suck. You're like, well, <laughs> what the hell happened here, guys? Yeah. Well, look, me giving them a, a, a speech is not a magic bullet. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, I'm not a magician. I don't it's, know. That let it fucking they, rip they, speech. That was they, a magic bullet. Let it fucking rip, man. Let it fucking rip. And then we scored some points and got off. Yeah, we looked like we were off the chive and we were about to roll through the season, didn't we? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's the deal. Here's the thing about talking to the teams, man, is you got to, um, for me, there's two things. I want to know, I like to talk to the coach first because I don't want to go in there, talk about conservative, liberal, late, and getting players confused. You don't, I don't want to go in there with, completely different message than the our coaches have been throwing at the baseline right. as a baseline and message to the team. I don't want to think I'm like, well, fuck, wait, is this a new plan? Is this a new way to go about things? So I want to get generally what uh, be sort of synonymous with what the coaches are going for. I also could try to get a read of the team. Look, man, the, 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 the speech I'll give to the team after a 45 to six loss <laughs> is different than what I'll say to the team going into the Big 12 championship. You know, you get to a Big 12 championship, your team's confident. They don't need the rah-rah, let's get up. They're right. going to be amped. You know what I mean? Let's just let this one be about, hey, take, maybe take, everyone make sure and take 15 minutes tonight to think about how you got here, to think about your brothers, sisters, mom and dad, grandmothers who watched you play, why you love the game of football. Think about it for a minute and think about this up, you know, so maybe it's a calming thing that is still challenging them. Well, but after a 45 to three loss, I remember this, I went, went and talked to a, a, a team early in Mac Brown's career and we had just got our waxed by UCLA. And I remember being at practice and the team's confidence was so low, man. And in practice, the team was applauding clean handoffs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was important. like, applauding a clean handoff. And, and I remember Max saying, man, the team's morale and confidence is so low right now. You know, we, we, we I mean, a, 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 a completion for two yards. We were going, good job. And he built them out of that. Now, that's very different than talking to the national championship team about to go play USC. That team's rolling, man, highly confident. So what is your game plan? Know that, you know, fin- finish every single play. To, you know, until that things like that. Can, so the speeches are different for e- each time. Yeah. How, how do you where the team is? How do you time that out? Uh, because if you're not familiar with the city of Austin, their practice field is right underneath the I-35 overpass. So it's not exactly the quietest part of town. It's pretty noisy. Do you have to wait and we say to yourself like we have to do this after rush hour? Or are you just out there like screaming over cars? Ah, it, it's whatever hour, man. When we're in that, it doesn't matter if it's if there's 10,000 18 wheelers coming down I-35. It, it all the focus is right there on the field and I, and, I, and I'll speak over it. Yeah, um, I have one fact check to pull on your book. I don't know how much fact checking went into it, but you said um, towards the start of the book, I have a lot of proof that the universe is conspiring to make me happy. How can you possibly sit there and write that as a fan of the Washington football team? Hmm. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Doesn't add up. All right. Hey, we got time. It's a hundred year war. Thousand year war. We got time. Thousand year Washington war. Football team. Ah, you know, I've been a fan of the now called Washington football team up until recently. Uh, what was called the Washington Redskin team. You know, I grew up outside of Dallas. Um, I was the only at that time Redskin fan in Texas. Man, I mean, I would go to. I went to Texas Stadium. In a chamois, you know, the chamois you drive your car with. Mm-hmm. You know, was, I went to, in a, with a chamois wrapped around my waist with nothing but my underwear on under it and a rope wrapped around my waist, painted burgundy, head to toe with a headdress on and was on the 50-yard line in Texas Stadium when the Redskins played the Cowboys. Was that four years I, ago? I would sneak Five out of church. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was about, I was in 19, I think, 78, 79. Um, I was at the... Last game at RFK, I have a mason jar with burgundy soil, grass from the soil from the end zone, last game of RFK. First game at Jack Kent Cook. 
first game at FedEx Field. Um, I've, you know, where I grew up wanting to be John Riggins, man. Mm -hmm. You know, 3.4 yards to carry the diesel name Desire, Mr. October, man. In the backyard, you couldn't get me down because I was John Riggo Riggins, man. I grew up with the Fun Bunch. I hung out with, I chased down as a kid, Daryl Green. Uh, um, you know, uh, look at what the Redskins have done. Look at what they did with quarterbacks. Look what Joe Gibbs did with quarterbacks right. from Jay Schrader to Rippon to Doug Williams. Not journeymen that came in and were the right man for the job at that time. Yeah. And along with the 49ers, I mean, what was it, the 90s or the 80s that we basically sort of owned with the 49ers? Yeah. Um, Hey, we're here. We go rebuilding again. Let's see, man. Uh, we got to, you know, get the culture right over there. Uh, now with the now called Washington football team, what's the name going to be? What's the consensus out there? I'm pushing for Red Wolves. Wolves. Red I'm, Wolves I'm pushing yeah. for the Washington Red Wolves. I, th I just teeth. think it'd be cool that you got the teeth, you got all the fans in the stands just making big howling noises. If they play a game when there's a full moon, that'd be incredible. You can't bet against them then. Here we go. Uh, mm -hmm. I, just, I like that. I just think that they're. There are no professional football teams named after dogs, and everybody loves dogs, right? Yeah, but you got to watch. I mean, Red Bull is pretty aggressive. I mean, you can't have the poodles, you know what I mean? So, I mean, you still got to be have some, you still got to go out there and have a pretty intimidating name. Yeah, yeah. They, they yeah call Red Bulls work. Call them the yeah. Wolf Pack. Yeah, yeah I, we were actually talking to the president of the Washington football team because I, I was born and raised in Northern Virginia. So I grew up, you know, watching those teams. And you're right, Joe Gibbs does not get enough credit because I think he's the only head coach. Probably ever, probably from now even until the history of the NFL is, is written, that took three separate quarterbacks to three separate Super Bowl titles. That's pretty much impossible yeah. to do, especially now. And those quarterbacks didn't go on to be, you know, big. They weren't like first ballot Hall of Famers. They weren't like guys like they weren't Brady's and Baton Manning's. You know, they were guys at the right time, second stringers that, that took a, took a, took the opportunity and ran with it. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, this might be a weird question. I'm sure you've been asked it before, but when did you find out that like you were just cool? Like when was that moment? Did you know early on like I'm just cooler than people? <laughs> like that laugh was cool. Oh man, I mean look, yeah. I looked up to my uh I looked up to my big brother, um Pat, and he was the coolest, man. I mean, I write about it in the book. He was my inspiration for Wooderson and Days Confused. Now to this day, was he that guy? And he's like, you know, comes to me. Thanks a lot, man. And I'm like, no, dude, here's, it was you. I remember mom and I went to go pick you up at school because your Z28, which is super fucking cool, was broke down. And we were picking you up from school and we couldn't find you because you weren't where you were supposed to meet us. And I'm in the back of the station wagon and I'm looking out and I see this silhouette of this dude. Dude, leaning against a wall, brick wall, in the shadow section of the smoking section at school. He's got his left leg up, boot heel against a wall, hanging a cigarette and a lazy right hand, bringing it up, <laughs> toking it. And I go, there's Pat. And I had to stop because I knew my, he'd get in trouble for smoking, but it was my brother. And man, in that image in my eyes outside the back of that station wagon, he was cooler than James Dean. He was 10 feet tall, man. He was the stud. And so that's who sort of Wooderson came based on. We've been taught, look, I think what's cool, here's what's cool. Being yourself and being being cool with yourself and just not trying to be everything to everybody or trying, you know, you, I, I got no problem with nerds. I just don't like dorks. A dork tries to be everything to everybody. And yep. You can't really trust them. Yep. Uh -huh. I know some nerds that are real cool. I know right. some very cool nerds, but I'm not a fan of dork. Give me an asshole before you give me a dork. At least I know where the asshole stands. Yeah. You know what I mean? Assholes I like can that. be cool, too. So, I like that. By the way, you told a great you know story I'm in your memoir uh, about your brother, Pat, who was adopted, and your parents said every year, like, let's, you know, go see your adopted, you know, your birth, your birth parents. And he said, no, no, no. Yeah. And then when he was 19, he's like, all right, let's go do it. He shows up. He goes inside, meets him, comes back out in two minutes. And your parents are like, what's going on, Pat? And he's like, I just wanted to make sure my dad wasn't going bald because I'm starting to – my hair started I'm starting to, get to lose my hair and that was it they, they, that was the only time he saw his birth parents that's it that's cool one see him again all right that's cool. that was cool that's, that's cool very yeah, that's yeah. that's really cool uh one of the coolest things that you wrote in this book was a story about when you when you traded in your truck you thought you had all the answers at that point yeah. you realized very quickly that you didn't I, I actually think that story 
it's a it's a nice allegory, not just in sports but in life. But if you want to like kind of give the background of what you learned from that, I think that's really yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So let's this this is a good topic on cool too, on what's cool and what's not cool. Um, so I got a truck in in high school. I'm the guy who parks in the first parking lot. I got a speaker down in the grill in the front of the truck in the morning when all the students are going up to the um, the class through the first parking lot. I'm the guy that's down there going, oh, look at Kathy Cook's jeans this morning, looking good, you know, and everyone turns around and go, where's that coming from? And Kathy Cook gets embarrassed and we all laugh. Then I pop up and they know it's me and we're all having fun. I'm the guy that danced at the party. I'm the guy that no matter what time we got to the concert, I'm going to work my, we're going to take my date. We're going to work our ass up to the front row and go rock. Well, I'm driving down the road one day in my truck and I go by this Nissan dealership and I see this candy red 300 ZX sports car. I said, I just got to pull in there, man, and have a look at that. Well, it was hot shit. And then the guy was really motivated to sell it. And I never had a sports car. And on the spot, I traded him in my truck for that red 300 ZX. Cut to the next day. I'm not parking the first parking lot. I park in the third parking lot. So, you know, nobody opened the doors and dent my candy red ZX, man. I'm also noticing that I think my car is such hot shit that I'm just going to get out and lean against that son of a bitch and just be cool and go look at me and my new red 300 ZX with T-tops. How cool am I? You became a dork. Well, the girls got disinterested, <laughs> huh? You became kind of a dork when you got the cool car. Became kind of a dork relying on my car. Yeah. You know, looking in the proverbial mirror at myself, letting wanting my car to do the work for me. Yeah. Well, the girls got pretty disinterested pretty quickly. And when I'm saying in the after school, you want to go ride around with me and my red 300 ZX with the T-tops down, they're like going, no, we're going to go mudding with Trey Hickman like we used to do with you. <laughs> well, after about a month and a half, things dry up for me, man. The chicks are not digging me and my red sports car that I'm leaning against in the third parking lot. And I realized, dude, you, 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 you coup de grace yourself. You outfoxed yourself. This fucking red sports car is just talk about it's blue balling you, man. You, you got to get rid of this son of a bitch. So I went down and traded it in back in for my truck, drove my truck back to school the next day, parked in that first parking lot, got on my megaphone, started chasing and being the fun guy again, engaged. And I was back in with the girls. That fucking red sports car almost screwed me for a while, man. I love it. But that was one of those deals. I was trying too hard. I, was letting, I wasn't working. I wasn't hustling. I quit hustling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got the red sports car. I thought I could do the work. I think it's a, it's a great story. It reminds me of I what we talked about on this show with Ryan Fitzpatrick and, and the Dolphins. You could put two in right now. He's your sports car, but Ryan Fitzpatrick's fun. He's a truck. He's good. You never know what you're going to get yes. with him. Don't take Ryan Fitzpatrick away from us just yet. Run him until he's got 300,000 miles on him. Then go get that sports car out. Right, right. Heard. Yeah. Heard. Um, I have a question. You've done a million movies. They're all, I mean, you, you've done some unbelievable movies. You won an Oscar. You had your rom-com stretch. Did you have a moment where you're like, I'm just going to start making, I've done the rom-com thing. I'm now I'm just going to make kick-ass movies that everyone's like, these are incredible and I'm an incredible off uh, actor. Did you have that moment in your head where the where you flip yeah. the switch? No, here's what happened. Here's what happened. So I'm rolling the rom-coms. They're very successful. I'm the rom-com guy. I took the baton from Hugh Grant years before and ran with it, right? Yep. They're fun. They're easy. I like doing them. They're paying well. They're paying for the rent of my house on the beach that I'm running around surfing shirtless on. I'm like going, hell yeah. But around that time, I've met Camilla, my now wife, and we made a baby and had Levi. So I got a newborn. All of a sudden, man, my life is more full than it's ever been. I'm, my life is vital, man. I've had a newborn. I'm finally a father. I've met the woman I want to spend the rest of my life with. I get, uh, you know, I laugh louder. I love harder. I get, have more rage. I have more joy. Life is just full, man. And the ceiling in the basement of how I'm feeling, life is alive. But in my work, I'm feeling kind of like, yeah, I could get another rom-com. I could do that tomorrow morning. I di didn't, I wasn't feeling the vitality I need. I wasn't feeling challenged by it. So I said, I wonder if I can find some work that can challenge the vitality of my life that I'm living in right now and the man I am in it. Well, the work that I wanted to do to challenge that was not getting offered to me. Those movies I wanted to do, they were like, no, not with you, McConaughey. You're the rom-com shirtless guy. Uh, you, you're not, we're not going to let you do this movie. 
Okay. So I said, if I can't do what I want to do, I'm going to quit doing what I've been doing. And I remember talking with my money man saying, hey, I'm about to stop doing rom-coms and those things that are offered, offered to me. How, my, how did I handle my money? Because you handle your money well, you can take off work for a while. I check with my agent. I check with Camilla, man. Drop many a tear on her shoulder going, I'm about to stop doing what I've been doing. And I don't know how long I'm going to go with that work. This could go on for a while. I'm going to get wobbly. You know what I mean? Geez, am I going to, you know, with no work and no significance to pursue every day? Am I going to, you know, am I going to start wanting to have a drink earlier in the day? You know what I mean? What's going to, what's good? I'm going to need, to, I'm going to need to keep my, stay on the rails here. And I'm going to need your, need your help uh, with just not being able to work. You know what I mean? And man gets, man gets significance from his work. Yeah. And I'm choosing to say no more work. Well, for six months, nothing came in but rom-com uh, offers. And I got to tell you a funny story about this. So like how puritanical was I about not doing these? This one comes in for $8 million offer. I read it. It's pretty good, but it's a rom-com. I say no. Comes back at a $10 million offer. I say no. Comes back at a $12.5 million offer. Uh, dot, dot, dot. Mm, no. Comes back at a $14.5 million offer. What do I say? Let me read that bitch again. <laughs> now I read it again. And I read it, and it was the exact same words as the original one, right? But, man, it was better written. It was funnier, it was more dramatic. I had more angles on this thing. I could make this work. It was the same words as the original offer, but a much more well-written script mm -hmm. at that offer. Anyway, I passed. When I passed on that, Hollywood sort of got the signal. Okay, McConaughey's not bullshitting. He's not doing the rom-coms or the action comedies anymore. So another year goes by, nothing comes in. Nothing comes in. I talk to my agent every couple of weeks, and it's just like nothing, nothing. A total of 20 months went by. And all of a sudden, Killer Joe comes my way. Mud comes my way. Magic Mike comes my way. Paperboy, True Detective. I can get Dallas Buyers Club made. All of a sudden, these movies and this run that I, that, I, that I went on come to me. So why? Well, I unbranded in that 20 months. I, you didn't see me. The industry didn't see me as a rom-com guy. You didn't see me in the tabloid shirtless on the beach. So all of a sudden, Matthew McConaughey for this dramatic role is now a new novel good idea. And a and good idea that I wouldn't have been 20 months prior. Yeah. So I unbranded to rebrand basically that's awesome. did you have I didn't to know how long it was going to go yeah that, I mean so. that takes a lot of guts and it takes a lot of like 14 and a half million dollars I, I will say you still have a little bit of the brand because I was looking up your IMDB and the third thing you're most known for is habitually taking off his shirt yes <laughs> guilty <laughs> your shirt off guy you're in J.R. Smith guy. and we'll continue yeah yeah you too man I mean and I was a shirt off guy since I was since I was born I never wore a shirt as a kid I mean ever i remember uh, um i used to play in the front play in the front yard on, in uvalde on, on getty street it was the busiest street in town and i'd be out front and i'd be in my, my in my you know diapers no shirt no shoes and i was a kind of a kind of a chubby little kid right and my oldest brother rooster and his friends knew at this time of the day i would be playing out front and i'm like four years old and he had this chrysler and him and his buddies would get in it and they'd drive and they knew I'm out. They knew I'd be out in the front yard. So about a half a mile down driving by, they'd start going, no, 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 Until they got right in front of me and go, no, 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 Fat man. And I chunk rocks out there across the street. And they drive by calling me fat man to the Batman theme, man, every damn day. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I was, uh, I, if I can go to weather where I don't have to wear a shirt, yes, you damn right. So did you have to consciously make an effort to like, when you leave the house, you got to put a shirt on today, Matthew, because you might get your picture taken and then boom, you're the rom-com guy again. Well, I mean, you know, shit, I became, con you know, I became conscious that at that time that became a thing. All right. I didn't, don't regret doing it. And I was going, you damn right. Those rom-coms I'm doing, like I said, pay for the rent that let me live on this, in a house that's on this beach where I can go shirtless. Now, I don't know about you, when you're on the beach, don't you like going shirtless? Yeah, so do I. So that's what I was doing. Now, I noticed that it became a thing, though. And when it became a thing, 
that ex- that the industry and maybe even the, most of the public excluded me from thinking I would could be right for these other roles. That's when I was like, oh, okay, oh, hang on a minute. Let me be aware enough to go. Maybe I need to recalibrate here and play this game a yeah. little differently. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't know what I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do, but I said, okay, I'm going to quit giving them that because that's feeding into that pigeonhole that they're putting me in. Mm-hmm. So I consciously said, all right, I'm, 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 all right, I'm, I'm going to play this Joker card. I'm going to, I'm going to play a different hand here. Yeah. Now, as far as the movies that, that you've been in, do you go, do you watch them in theaters? No, I haven't even seen all my movies, man. I love, I love making them more than I love watching them. What I, this movie you probably don't get asked about often, but I have to ask two for two for the money. Two for the money, yeah. Did you do any Branded. research? Yeah. So we actually work with the guy who it's about, Stu Finer, who is okay. plays Al Pacino. We we do the Sports Advisors show. It's actually a parody now of the original Sports Advisors, where we're terrible gamblers, but we give out picks every week, and it's ridiculous and it's stupid. And Stu, we basically brought Stu back from the dead. Uh, did you watch any of the original sports advisors to get like a feel of what they were doing back in the day? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did. I, I watched a lot. I interviewed a lot. I talked to my brother. I got a story in the book about it. My, my Pat, my brother, middle brother, man, P-A-T, he had it. He had this one guy that he went on a 27 and two run. <sighs> he talk about it hot. And I saw him, and and I remember, <laughs> you know, when someone's on a run in the middle of that run, you don't want to you don't want to find out their picks when they're twenty seven and two. You want to find yep. out their picks when they're like you know six and zero, oh, mm-hmm. and then ride them. Well, we were all going to Pat, going, "Hey, but what 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 are the picks, man?" And he was rolling, and he, he obviously when you're rolling, you start betting more. And I think it was that thirtieth game after twenty seven and two that that he loaded up on an absolute diamond pick, man, absolute diamond lock. <laughs> we bet the house, bet the house, and the team got it was like a seventeen point favorite, and they got waxed by twenty. Oh, uh, uh, well, Stu's still doing his thing. He's still giving out mortal locks, and uh, they're not doing well, but he's still doing his thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, you got we'll set we'll get it to you it's it's a it's a trip to watch him like because it really is kind of a parody of what he used to do but he used to do it for real and what the whole movie's about of guys trying to get other people to buy their picks and to be like i got yeah. the lock of the century don't worry like i've done all the research when really it's just kind of making shit up as you go along well i've heard things of you know what the, you know that story about the the which team and let's you know put two bowls of dog food see which one the dog goes to after yep. after the line i mean after vegas makes that line now there are you, you i talk about it in the book i love the intangibles yes you know yes I'm, i don't like going to a tout service because i just want to sit there i like the fun of when i think and believe that you know uh miami's gonna be jet lagged against san fran yep. and they come out slow in the first half and end up in in San Fran ends up covering. I'm like, I can do it. Did no shit, man. Jet lag, man. They're constipated. They can't yeah. run around. They flew in too late. They flew in on Saturday instead of last Wednesday. Uh, blah, blah. Or Brett Favre, dad just passed away. Oh, he's playing for more than the game. He's mm-hmm. gonna be unconscious tonight. Boom. Well, you know, then I love going. Knew it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like one but. of the best. One of the best bets I've ever made in my life was after Bevo passed, whichever the last one was. And you had to bet on Texas when Bevo passes away, and they won. That's it. Bevo passes away, good reason to win. Sylvester Stallone opens up Lincoln Stadium for the Philadelphia Eagles. Yes. Mm-hmm. The brand-new stadium. Do not bet on Philadelphia on Monday night because all the attention is on fucking Rocky Balboa. And, wow, <laughs> isn't this stadium cool? And none of that shit has to do with the game on the field. But you I, – I actually have a tweet. I went and looked. like I, I Google searched how many times I've mentioned you. I have a tweet – you fucked me when you wore your orange uh, tuxedo against Kansas State. And I I have a tweet being like, could someone have told me McConaughey was sitting on the fucking bench in his orange t- tuxedo? My bet is fucked. Like, you were the motiva- the minister, co- what are you, minister of morale? Yeah, you covered. Minister of culture. I was fucked. Yeah. You you yeah. fucked me on that one. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was bringing about a four and a half point advantage there. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. There's a part of the book that it says that you bet on the Buffalo Bills in the Super Bowl. Ooh. Oh, shit fire. Yes. <laughs> you remember this? 
<laughs> what, what, yeah. what went into that? What intangibles did you crunch in your it's head? Got, you were just like, they're, they're due, right? Yeah, you were thinking, due. they can't lose again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to the charm, Jim Kelly, Andre Reed, Thurman Thomas, they got waxed last year. They made it back this year. The Cowboys, I mean, they're calling the Cowboys like this dynasty. And I mean, and the night before, my brother and I had rolled on the, uh, on the uh, blackjack table. So our pockets were full, uh, relatively speaking, for us. And we were going to let it all hang out on this day. So the line was huge. And while we were there in Vegas, the line jumped up even. Like we found this one place that the line was two and a half points more than anywhere else. I think it got up to like 12 or, or maybe even 14. I don't remember what it was. So we load up on everything the buffalo billionaires you could i mean eight to one thurman thomas will have more than emmett uh, uh andre's gonna have more than irvin uh sex six to one jim kelly or aikman 12 to one i mean everything bruce smith the mvp <laughs> mm -hmm. and the bills come out looking good i think they were up right yeah and we're we're dancing buying doubles man not just for us but for the whole damn bar lock well, as you know, the second half, the Cowboys came out and waxed them and, and covered. And I remember, <laughs> I remember walking out of there, you know, that numb feeling. Cause we got so high with the, we've done it. We, we knew it. We figured that we, we were going to win. We're going to dance our way back. We might even upgrade to first class to fly home. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, whoop, in two quarters, gone. And I remember, uh, uh, we get out, we get out. And we're now catching a cab back to the Holiday Inn where we're staying. And this dirty, dusty-ass cab pulls up. And we get in the back. I'm looking out the back left window. My brother Pat's looking out the back right window, just kind of licking our wounds, man. Now the, the buzz is turning to hang over. And we're getting really tired. Break is starting to sweat. Kind of not even hungry. Our, our stomachs are too turned to even eat. And we're like, ah, get dry mouths. This sucks. And all of a sudden, we hear this voice. This guy goes, Oh, you bet on the bills, did you? <laughs> we look up, and it's this cabbie. Big bearded guy. Kind of He's looking in the rearview mirror, and he goes, <laughs> fucking losers. Could have told you that. Anybody betting on the bills against the Cowboys, you're fucking losers. The Cowboys were a lock. <laughs> My brother, Pat, just goes, oh, yeah, motherfucker. If you fucking knew it, what are you doing driving a fucking cab? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It was like, oh man, it was, it was, it was such a moment. My brother was so hot, but it was really a, a opportune, really comment at the time. Well, yeah, you, you can't say that to somebody uh, if, yeah. if you can tell that they just lost. You Whoa. can't be like, yeah, it was a lock in retrospect. You just described basically every day for me on Twitter. Because every day after a game kicks off, everyone's like, you bet that, you fucking idiot. Like this was guaranteed to go the other way. Well, <laughs> thanks, man. It's already the third quarter. Well, after the fact, we all knew it. Yes. You know, that's what's fun about gambling. You know, after it's done, sure, you knew it. Yeah. You know? So yeah. you don't put any stock at all in, in animals betting because my dog is 3-0 and on Monday Night Football Three right one. now. 3-0 and in games that start before 8.30 there you go. on Monday Night Football. So if, you want, if you're looking for somebody to tail right now, I, I feel like my Mastiff is off to a hot start. He might go 27-2. and two. I trust give me, animals. Give me some tips, man. I trust the animal yeah. instinct to a certain point. We had a goldfish that went sixty percent a couple of years ago over the course of a whole season. Whole man. season. You can make a live. You can make a living on that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, there was there was one quote that you put in your book that you did not expand on, and I'm curious to to hear the entire backstory behind this. You just kind of this is like a throwaway line. If you're Matthew McConaughey, this is how cool you are. You can just toss this out here and forget that you even said it. You said, I've done peyote in Rail de Catorce, Mexico, in a cage with a mountain lion. Yeah. Then you just moved on Fact. from that. What's, what's, the, what's the story? How did that go down? Well, I'm in Rail de Catorce, and I'd gone off on an, a sunrise walk with the shaman. And he was, very, in a very cool way that a shaman can do, slowly disseminating the peyote as we hiked up this huge mountain that took hours to hike up. And it was an awesome walk and it was an awesome return. And when I got back down uh, on his property, there was this, he had this mountain lion in his cage. And I get up next to the cage and under so said influences of such peyote, I'm getting on the same frequency of the mountain lion. And the mountain lion's <laughs> getting on the same frequency 
has McConaughey. And so now this mountain lion's up next to the gate and kind of just sticking whiskers through and I'm, I'm, I'm scratching his under. And so I get confident that me and this mountain lion are on the same frequency. So I move over to the gate and enter so said cage mountain lion jumps around i move very slowly making sure to stay on the same frequency as so said mountain lion i move over to the corner slowly sit down for about an hour this mountain lion parries back and forth and slowly starts getting a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer until he comes up next to me and gets very close to my hand wanting to get some more itches under his chin like he did when I was outside of the cage. I slowly give him a little scratch. I don't intrude his space. I lean back. An hour after that, that son of a bitch is sitting in my lap purring. And I sat there for another hour and a half. So I spent about four hours total in the cage, then slowly got up and went my way. And it was a really incredible experience. Is that, I mean, is that one that you look back on in the diary and you're like, you're scared for yourself in the past reading it sober? No, no, no. I mean, no, I was, I was, you know, if you, I don't know if you've ever done a peyote trip with just peyote and water. And if you do it the right way with the shaman, I would say I was incredibly sober. Um, I wasn't out of my mind at all. If anything, I was more in tune uh, than, 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 than normal. Uh, that's a great thing about peyote done the right way. Um, no, I, I don't look back on that at all. I look back on that and go, if, if anything, if you look through the book, there's times I've taken what would be a considered risk that absolutely paid off. I would have regretted my instincts that I could make that work if I wouldn't have gone in. And you're just like that wrestling match in Africa. If I wouldn't have said yes to that challenge, I'd regret that to this day. Yeah. And by saying yes to that challenge, gave me, he's given me gifts since mm -hmm. because of the people I met, the lessons I learned, uh, all kinds of stuff. It's also, you kind of have like an out there where if things go wrong and Matthew McConaughey dies uh, tripping on peyote by a mountain lion, like that's pretty much the coolest way to die. You're a legend forever right there. So there's no, nothing but upside. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it'd be part of the food chain. Right. Which is, if I can go, if we can, if I can go, I, I hope that's how it is. I hope it's not by a drive, a, a random drive by. Right. Yeah. You <laughs> live rather, forever. I'd rather go move on as part of the food chain. Yeah, you live forever in that respect. There's uh, probably also an element of the mountain lion just n understanding that he was. This was Matthew McConaughey. He's right. pretty cool. Like, oh, this guy. This is the dude from the Lincoln commercials. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. This guy sits in his car and looks at Longhorn bulls in the middle of the road and. <laughs> Doesn't go around him. He decides to let them have the right of way. Turns around and goes his own way. Yeah. 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 Plays pool while everyone's sitting at a dinner party, and he's just cool about it. <laughs> yeah. Sings, <laughs> sings trick shots in the other room yeah. while the rest of the people are in there having a dinner party. Do you write? Do you do you have anything to do with the creatives of those? Because it's very McConaughey to do an ad where you'll see guys do ads, and you'll be like, "Oh, they're selling out." You somehow do ads that are like, "Oh, that's just McConaughey being cool." I didn't even realize it was an ad. Well, that is the goal. I mean, look, we got together. I, I do work on those ads with them. I mean, we got together early on and said, look, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to play a cool McConaughey. I'm going to move deliberately. I'm going to move slowly. Me like the Lincoln need it's to, I need to move deliberately. I need to move with identity and confidence to always take my time. And so then that led to, well, let's not be really loud in the commercial. Let's not make it really packed. We actually looked at, looked at the market and said, that all the ads out there are so damn loud. Can we make something that actually cuts through all that with the silence? And I remember the first ad we came out with, you know, playing them on, you know, Sundays during NFL football. And everything's, ah, then all of a sudden, shoo, drop down. And I remember I was at a bar and I remember people turning around to the TV like they were interrupted by the silence mm -hmm. of the ad. And then all of a sudden we're drawn to it. And so we got fortunate that they stuck and now, you know, they can come on and in about three seconds, you kind of know, even before I show up, oh, this is going to be a McConaughey Lincoln ad. Yeah. You know, just by the sound design and the quiet, how quiet is the tone, the pace, of the shots, you know. Well, I, I want to thank you personally because I have a running joke that I'm trying to get Jeff Fisher another job coaching. It's been going on for probably about four years now. And I use 
the sometimes you got to go back to actually move forward for every single one. It's always the same. So that has – if Jeff Fisher ever gets a job, you're part partially to thank for that. Via you. Via, well, via you. Okay. Via, via you, me. via me. Yeah. Okay, via us. Go yes. Ahead. It's perfect that I don't know. I actually got the idea because someone it got taken down, but someone made that uh, with Harbaugh when he went back to Michigan because it was like the perfect. After he got hired, they made the hype video. Sometimes you got to go back to actually move forward. And I was like, ah. oh my god, this is like okay. I have chills up and down my spine. And so then I was like, let me just do this for Jeff Fisher, even though he has no relation to any of these teams. I just fucking threw it in there, being like, yeah, you just. Because there's something about the glory days when you're trying to recapture like a team's, you know, it could work for Texas. You're trying to go back to move forward. You're trying to get those glory days back. Go, but like I was saying earlier, man, about writing diaries about not only when you're losing, write them down, write write stuff down, dissect the, dissect the success, right? Go write in your journal when things are going well mm -hmm. so you can look back and go, oh, yeah. I see what I was, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. I took that for granted. Oh, I'm complacent in that area. Oh, I see. It's It can be a good map for going, how do I get back on track and have more success or satisfaction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always, I, I've tried to journal in, in previous careers. It was like highly recommended to me to keep a diary, keep a journal every day, write down what worked, what didn't work. But there's nothing more daunting than just sitting down and looking at an empty page and then it's like, where do you start describing your day? So when you start describing your day in your journal, are you are you just like listing out the things that happen or how much writing does it take for you to get into the real introspective parts? No, I mean, sometimes it's just a word. It's something I'll hear somebody say. Um, it's something I'll say that I'll, off the cuff and someone will go, oh, and I'll go, what did I just say? And I'll go, well, I'm going to write that down. I didn't even think about saying it. And I said that. And it's a, it's a phrase that'll capture something. That's why I love when I talk about bumper stickers. Bumper stickers don't, they're kind of informal, cool ways to, they let you know who the hell is behind the, behind the wheel, man. They tell you their politics. They tell you if they got a family. They tell you what denomination they are. They tell you if they're pro guns or not. They tell you if their kids are an honor roll student or a badass. They, you can learn so much from a damn bumper sticker. It doesn't tell you what to do. And it's a very informal way of learning a lot through a certain sort of bumper sticker stereotype of situation. And then pull up and have a look at, the people in the car and see if they match what that bumper sticker looks like how much did they match what was in your mind about how you thought who how you thought they were going to look or you see people next to you at the red light and you look at them and you get an idea of who they are and then they pull forward and then you look at their bumper sticker does it match what their bumper sticker is you know what i mean so i'll have ideas you know and, and work off of that's why i call bumper stickers in the book i'll have a one-liner that i'm like oh that applies to a lot let me take that out into my life and see how I can apply that aphorism. Once you know it's black, it's not near as dark. Well, that's basically a bumper sticker for saying, hey, COVID sucks. Let's admit it sucks. It's here for a while. So let's get on with it because I know it's black. Now that I'm admitting it's black, it ain't near as dark. Shit, so can, really, you can apply good. it to many things. Yeah, you know? blew my mind. How many times a day do you say things and then have other people tell you what you just said should be a bumper sticker. Um, because I've just picked out like four pretty, or five. I'm, over I'm the told I'm pretty chat. good at. Yeah. I mean, I'm told I'm I I I, I I'm pretty good at slogans. I'm, I know I'm good. At, I've always been told I'm good at nicknames. Um, after I get to know somebody. Um, I don't know. I love boiling things down. I'll read a story. I'll I'll, I'll read, you know, an article, and then I love deconstructing down like what is three words or a one liner or a cool way to phrase that entire article in a way that is affirmative, that feels like a verb, that feels like a bumper sticker. Mm -hmm. I love to boil things down and deconstruct things down to a one line, a one word, you know? Um, Do you read And books? that sound musical. I like lyrics. I love music. Yeah. So like, I think of them as like lyrics, Yeah. you know? Are you a book guy? My what guy? A book guy. Do you read books? No, not really. Mostly like I'm, I'm a very, very slow reader and I haven't read many books actually in my, in my life. Um, you know, we weren't really pressed to read by my parents. My mom was very much a, you know, we couldn't watch TV. You really couldn't read a lot because she was always like, well, 
why read about or watch somebody do something that you can just get your ass out there and go do yourself. She was always real active. Go out and go do it. Go experience it. Um, get into life. Um, so we weren't raised to read much. And then as I got older, I, I tried to read and I still do read, but I'm a very, very slow reader. And the reason is, I think, say, if I'm reading, you know, philosophy or, or, or some motivation or something, I'll, I'll read men. You ever read uh, Emerson's essay on self-reliance? Yeah, I did in college. Dude, it's wicked badass. It's so it's so damn good. Well, I've I've read that twice, but it's taken me twenty years to read it twice, even though it's only like fifteen pages. The reason is I'll read one paragraph and go, whoa, oh, that's heavy, dude. I'm gonna take that paragraph into life every day and see if I can apply it and see what the reverb is. See if it pays me back. See if my life changes a little bit. See if my interactions change a little bit. See if the way I see the world changes a little bit. And I'll work on that damn thing for a month that one paragraph before I can move on to the next one. So I'm a very slow reader in that respect. So I would assume though, uh, green lights, your, your memoir, which is out October 20th, there's going to be an audio book, which will be the greatest audio book of all time. If you narrate it, correct? I performed it. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I just did it the other day. I, I just I, did it the other day. I don't know a, how that's not like the best audio book of all time already. Just with your voice telling your stories. I would imagine that's, I mean, that's how do you not get that? How do you not it, get that? It was fun, man. It was fun. And I get to play, you know, like all the story, these stories in the, most of these stories in the book, I perform them. I tell them at dinner parties. I tell them around the campfire. I've told them. I perform them. So you're getting my innuendo and my voice goes up and you're getting my voices when I do the Australians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then I had to go to the written word. You don't get all that. Right. So I thought writing the book that I could record myself telling the best version of the story and just transcribe that to the page. And that would be the best version on the page. It was not. It was 30% too long. The written word, the written stories are 30% shorter than the, than, the, than the performed vocal stories. So when I did the audio book, so I got to play the voices, play the characters, give you the little pauses, the nonverbal cues, of, mm, mm -hmm, mm, <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah, so being able to perform it, uh, the stories was was a whole lot of fun. It was probably my favorite read of the book for me when I got to read it out loud. Yeah. And revisit those times and perform them all in sequence through the entire book. I'd imagine. All right, so I had one last question. I uh, found this. I, I love the scene in Wolf of Wall Street when you do the – the chest bumping and then i read a story that you that actually you do that before you go and act every single time to pump yourself up yeah so can we do that once can we just do it you want to do the wolf of wall street one no or the one or I mean, just the matthew mcconaughey whatever you're feeling right now because you said you do it in a different like tune or or whatever you're feeling oh me 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 yeah we can do that all day oh that man oh, what was that bird that was a cool thing. bird yeah that's fucking sick. It's a, I'll do that before, you know, before I'm going to go give a speech. I get, you get, you get nervous or something. Try it. It'll get you out of your head. And it'll sort of also doing that on your chest to lower your voice uh -huh. and relax you. And it makes people go, what the fuck is he doing? <laughs> which is also a good tool because they think you're, you're out of your mind, which is usually somewhat true, which gives you an advantage when you go do what you do because you feel like you're on an island. Also, just the human body craves contact. Yeah. So you start slapping yourself around a little bit. You're like, okay, now I'm living. Yeah. This is life. The blood flowing, man. Oh, yeah. love it. I love it. Well, this has been awesome, Matthew. Everything we wanted and more. Uh, everyone go buy Green Lights out October 20th. Your memoir. Uh, great read. Great listen when the audio book comes out. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it, man. I enjoyed it, man. Y'all have a great one. Let me know those picks, whatever your dog picks for Monday Night Football, I will. all right? And I'll, if Jeff Fisher yeah. comes around, yep. let me know. I'll, yep. I'll, I'll tweet it at you. And good luck trying to get Texas back. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that will ever happen, but we'll, you'll see. And we'll make the Red Wolves happen, too. Yeah. yeah. We be in process. We be in process. <laughs> Hook them. All right. See you, man. See you.